Hey, what's up, everybody? Pastor Matt here. Thanks for checking into the YouTube channel. Hey, a couple of weeks ago, I did a video on the Greek New Testament, and I talked about why I am a critical text guy versus a textus receptus guy. If I just already lost you with those two terms, I have other videos that you're going to want to watch ahead of this one, although this one's going to be pretty cool. After I did that video, I got a long response from Dr. Jeff Riddle, who I respect, who went through my video and he replied to a number of points, some of which were helpful, others were convincing, others uh, had still have some questions about, but I did go ahead and uh, listen very carefully to his video. And I also began to read through Maurice Robinson's long introduction to the Greek Byzantine majority text and found some of the things there very helpful, if not uh, altogether convincing. So I've been thinking about my position. Now, one thing I said a couple of videos ago on that video about the critical text is that I would like to consider a lot of these minor variations on a point by point basis. In other words, to consider each text individually. And so there are a couple of texts that are very important in this discussion, one of which is the longer ending of the Gospel of Mark. Now, it just so happens by God's divine providence that I'm supposed to preach on Mark chapter 16 this coming up Wednesday night at our church plant. And so I thought this would be the perfect opportunity for me to do a deep dive into Mark's gospel and uh, to consider the longer ending on its own merits. Now, before we do that, what we're going to do in this video is we're going to look at a lot of old ancient Greek manuscripts of the ending of Mark. So I think it's going to be a very cool journey for us to go on together. But before we do that, let's look at a sample page of any old um, modern printed critical text of the Greek New Testament. This happens to be the book of Hebrews, which is not under discussion in this video. But you can see here, pros hebreos to the Hebrews. And then it says, uh, at many times and in various ways of old, God spoke to our fathers and the prophets. In these last days, though, he has spoken to us in his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You'll notice here that each of the words is separated. That sentence, this sentence begins with a capital, but rest most of the rest is in lowercase letters. We have nice bold verse numbers. We have a poetic setting, and quotations from the Old Testament are in bold. Beautiful, wonderful tools that we have in our hands, these Greek New Testaments, whether we prefer the critical text or the textus receptus. By the way, I believe both parties can hold to a very high view of Scripture. In fact, whenever I preach on the Lord's Day, I always uh, have my people stand for the reading of the Word of God, and I declare it to be the inspired, inerrant, and infallible Word of the only true and living God. So whether you prefer the TR or the critical text, I still believe you can hold a very high view of Scripture, as I myself do. Now, what I'd like to do is to take a deep dive into ancient manuscripts and look at the ending of the Gospel of Mark, and we're going to see what we can learn from doing this kind of research. Now, you can do this too, and that's the wonderful thing, although it's not going to be quite as easy if you can't read Greek, but I'm going to take you through this. What we're looking at here is the Center for the Study of New Testament Manuscripts, a very important website, csntm.org because their goal is to catalog with high quality digital photography as many of the scrolls and manuscripts and codices uh, as they possibly can get into high quality film because uh, parchment doesn't last forever, vellum doesn't last forever, papyrus certainly does not last forever. And even things like wars end up destroying a lot of manuscripts over the centuries. So even right now in Ukraine, there's concern for loss of important ancient documents. Certainly so with the Iraq War. Prior to that, uh, World War II, and prior to that, World War I, these how, this is how many of these things are lost. So the work of the Center for the Study of New Testament Manuscripts is very valuable and very important. And so what I did, you can do this too, although maybe it'll be harder because you can't read Greek. Some of you, some of you can. Um, blessings if you can, blessings if you can't. Just hang with me. So what I did is I put Mark 16 into the search dialog right here. I click search, and it brings up in relative chronological order, the, the, the major New Testament manuscripts that are extant, that means still existing today, that we can look at. Of course, unfortunately, the autographs, what Mark actually wrote with his own hand, all of the autographs have been lost. They were most likely did, done on papyrus because the early church was poor. It was persecuted, didn't have great uh, financial resources necessarily. So most of the manuscripts, indeed all of the manuscripts that we have today, 
do not come from uh, the apostles themselves, although we have a few papyrus fragments like P52 and others that are very old, first century perhaps even. Most of what we have is from the third, fourth, fifth, and so on centuries here. So, so we searched for Mark chapter 16, and this is what you're going to get. Now, I already have these tabbed up on the top of my browser here. So let's go and let's look at this first one right here. What are we looking at? This is the end of the Gospel of Mark. Okay, and you can click on manuscript information. And so we know that we're looking at Codex Sinaiticus, a fourth century manuscript of the Greek Old Testament, the New Testament, the epistle, Epistles of Barnabas, the Shepherd of Hermas on parchment. Okay, we can see here that it's fourth century and that it's majuscule style. That means all capital letters, no spaces in the words, because it's going to be a little bit tough to read here, but we're going to see what we can do. All right. So let's close that. And here we have the end of the Gospel of Mark. Now, how do I know that? Well, first of all, it says it over here. That's my cheat. But if I look right here, and I'm going to zoom in as best as I possibly can here, what the scribes did at the end of every book is they wrote the title of the book at the end. And so here we have the word uh, euangelion. It's a uh, return space here. So it's broken into two parts, but this is the word euangelion, the gospel. Kata, K-A-T-A. -A. Can you see that? Kata. Markon, so the gospel according to Mark. Again, this very, very old document here. And let's see how it ends. That's what's relevant to us in this, this discussion. How do they end the gospel? Because in my New Testament, I've got the ESV in front of me. I have this notation. Some of the earliest manuscripts do not include Mark 16, 9 to 20. Some of them have it ending at verse 8, which says, and they went out and fled from the tomb for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at the last sentence. And what we have here is the word ephabuntone. Okay, they were afraid. And the last word here is gar, which is the word for. Now, that's a strange word to end a sentence. And sentences in Greek are not usually ended with the word for. Um, Usually that word gar is in the middle or the beginning of a sentence, but this is the short ending here then, because we have that they were afraid, ephabunto gar. See that? Ephabuntone, ephabunto gar. Easy for me to say. And look at this flourish right here. This is the indication that the book is over. And what this scribe does is then leaves the rest of this column blank. And then Luke's gospel begins properly right here at the top of this next column over here. This is the beginning of the gospel of Luke. And so if this was the only New Testament manuscript we had, then we would think that it properly ends with the shorter ending at the end of verse 8, because that's all that this particular uh, manuscript has. It ends with a shorter ending, okay? And that's an important one, because this, again, is Codex Sinaiticus, 4th century, very important manuscript. Let's go to another one here. And this is one of my favorites. Now, some of you are going to be mad because I said this is my favorite, because this one has sometimes some strange readings in it. Um, but man, look how beautiful this is. Look at that lettering. It's so perfect. It's like a font. It's like somebody typed that out, but they did this by hand. It's amazing. So let's look at the manuscript information here. This is Codex Vaticanus. Now, all the Protestants are going to freak out because that's from the Vatican. In fact, that's where it's stored is in the Vatican Library. But Codex Vaticanus is an important fourth century majuscule manuscript. It contains Matthew, several other books of the New Testament right here, again, fourth century. And is it in the majuscule style? Majuscule or uncial means all caps, no spaces between the words. Okay, so let's have a look at this one. Let's close this out. Again, that beautiful handwriting is so amazing. Now we can see here that somebody later in pencil went along and very lightly wrote the verse numbers. So even if you can't read Greek, you're going to know where this one ends because this one is going to end at verse 6, 7, verse 8. Here is the ending right here. And look at this. <clears throat> again, we have the last word is gar or the word for, which again is a strange place to end the sentence. Now, some people would say that Mark's gospel is brilliant because it ends here, because you have the early witnesses to the resurrection fleeing from the tomb, 
and astonishment and fear. And that leaves the reader in that same sense of, oh my goodness, what just happened here? What is going to be the result of this? And the scribe, likewise, with the other one, did a flourish here at the end of the book. And you can probably read this, even if you don't read Greek. There's the sign off. We have kata, according to Markon, according to Mark. And so we know that this is the end of the gospel of Mark. And we see the word ephabunto gar here, for they were afraid. That's the end of the shorter ending. Uh, and notice this here, <clears throat> that not only does he return down through the end of this column, but then this column here is blank before he goes over to Luke chapter 1 and begins Luke's gospel at the top left of the next column. Now, some people have conjectured here that the scribe is aware of the longer ending and left this column blank so as that somebody else might put it in. Maybe he didn't have the longer ending, okay? But taken together, these two manuscripts, if this was all we had, it would certainly seem to suggest that the Gospel of Mark ends at verse 8, and that would support um, the contention that the shorter ending of Mark is indeed correct. And, and that's why this is a little bit misleading here, because it says some earliest manuscripts do not include the longer ending. But this is really all we have. In fact, there's only one other ancient manuscript that doesn't have the longer ending. And that's actually a commentary. It's commentary number 304. You can look that one up as well. But what I'd like to do then is to move on to several of the manuscripts that do have the longer ending here. OK, so let's go next to this one right here. This is Codex Alexandrinus, a fifth century manuscript of the Greek Old Testament and the New Testament, and the Clementine Epistles on Parchments, fifth century, and it's stored in London. And we can see here that the text is not quite as clear as we wish, but again, we're looking at the, well, let's back out a bit here. So see, again, we have an empty column and we have the scribal flourish but let's go ahead and zoom in as much as possible here. And here's the one thing that we can read, the Euangelion, the Gospel, Kata Markon. So that's the sign off. But let's see what the ending of this one is. Okay, this one does not end with the word gar. Can you see that? In fact, it ends with the word samiu or samion, signs. And so what we have here is actually the longer ending. This this edition has all the way to the longer ending of Mark, all the way to verses 19 and indeed 20. Epikalathun tone samion, accompanying signs is the last line here. So this one absolutely does have the longer ending. And notice that this is an old one. This is this is fifth century. This is some pretty amazing stuff here. Okay. So let's close that out. And in fact, I'm going to give myself some more room to work over here. Let's go to this next one. This one right here is Codex Bezai, fifth century majuscule of the Gospels on parchment. It's a Greek Latin diglot, 415 some leaves. This one is in Cambridge. And it's pretty cool because this was, in, was actually owned by Theodore de Beza, who was one of Calvin's colleagues in Geneva. He was his successor as the leader of the Genevan Academy. Uh, Beza is one alongside Stephanus who edited Erasmus's Greek printed New Testament. And so this was a, a scroll that Beza had access to himself. Pretty cool to think that the reformer had his hands on this, this incredible beauty. And let's just have a look at this one here. A couple of things that we notice. Um, first of all, there's two columns here, not three. And we have two different languages here. We have the Latin on this side, and we have the Greek on this side, which this is why it's called a diglot, or one that has two languages, di, two, glot, two languages. So what we're interested in is uh, the Latin's interesting too, but mostly the Greek. So let's go to the last line of Mark. Notice here that it's written in a different color to add some beauty with the sign off. We've got euangelion, the gospel Kata Markon, the gospel according to Mark. And the last word is amen. Okay, that's not surprising though, but what is what is the ending? Well, it's the word samion right here. See that? Samion signs. Epikalathun tone samion, the accompanying signs. They were bearing accompanying signs. So this is the longer ending of, of Mark's gospel. So Codex Bezai is a witness for the longer ending, not the shorter ending. 
again, there's really only two that have the shorter ending. So how significantly can you weigh those two manuscripts? In my judgment, it would seem better to go with the majority of the manuscripts. That's one of Maurice Robinson's points in his introduction to the majority text, okay? Let's go to this next one here. Now, this next one, totally different handwriting. That's what's so cool about looking through these old scrolls, these old manuscripts. This one right here is Codex Cyprius, a ninth century manuscript of the Gospels on parchment, 267 leaves. It contains the Gospels, and it is housed in uh, Paris in the Bibliothèque Nationale, the National library. Okay, so let's see what we can discern here. Again, here's our scribal ending. We have euangelion katamarkan, and which ending does it have? Well, here's the word amen, but that doesn't help us much. What we're interested in is the last line, and here we have, again, the word semion. See how it breaks over to the next line? They just didn't care. They just ran over straight into the next line. No problem. No problem with breaking up words. Epicolathun tone samion, accompanying sign. So once again, this is a witness to the longer ending of the Gospel of Mark. Let's go to the next one. Here's another beautiful one. Uh, this one here, what we've got, Codex Regius, an 8th century manuscript of the Gospels on parchments. Majuscule style, again, same library in Paris, France. What do we have here for the ending? Well, first of all, just look at how beautiful that thing is. And we've got a really cool flourish here that makes this manuscript quite beautiful. And here's the title at the end, Euangelion Kata Markan. K-A-T, they put the T, the T up there, Kat Markan. Amen is the last word. And the last sentence here is broken. We have to go down to the last line, the previous column. And we can see Epicolathun tone samion, accompanying signs. Once, once again, a testimony to the longer ending of the Gospel of Mark. Let's go to the next one. What do we have here? Codex Washingtonianus, fourth or fifth century. So this is very, very old. These are as old as the two that didn't have the longer ending. This one is held in the Smithsonian, fourth and fifth century on parchments. Here's our flourish, our beautiful little designation that the book is over. Euangelion, katamarkan, what's the last word? Amen, right there. But what, what are we interested in? Those are the last line. Epicolathun tone samion, accompanying sign. So once again, we have yet another witness to the longer ending of the Gospel of Mark. Now, I just want to stop and point out something real quick here. Notice that this is a, a codex rather than a scroll or a roll. It's a single column. So those of you single column Bible lovers out there say woohoo. And you can see here that the page edges are frayed along the outside edge, and it would have been bound right here in the center column. In fact, if you look over here, you can see how the page edges would be frayed just like a regular old book. It was the Christians who invented the codex or the book. Praise God. Christians are the inventor of books, at least in the codex form. Pretty cool little factoid for you. Okay, but once again, uh, a witness for the longer ending and not the shorter ending. We can play this game all day long, but I do want to show you at least one more beautiful scroll here. This one is so cool, I just had to show it to you. Let's look at some information here. This is Codex Sangelensis, 9th century Greek Latin diglot. So we have Greek and Latin again. Ninth century, it says majuscule. I wonder if that's a mistype. It looks to me like it's a minuscule because if you look at the handwriting here, we definitely no longer have just the capital letters. Now we have the lowercase letters here and we're starting to see some spaces between the words. Yay, spaces between words make it excellent. Now this is not like Codex Beza, which had uh, the Greek on the left and the Latin on the right, but this one's like an interlinear. So if you have a Greek interlinear Bible, that's pretty cool stuff, right? Because you have the Greek on top of the English. Here we have the Latin on top of the Greek. And so um, what do we have here for the last line? Epicolathun tone, samion, accompanying signs. Once again, we have the longer ending of the Gospel of Mark. So uh, let me just bring up a little bit of summary information for you here. Um, in favor of the shorter ending of Mark's Gospel, we have Sinaiticus and Vaticanus from the fourth century. 
the only two Greek manuscripts that have the shorter ending. We do have minuscule number 304, which is a commentary. It's not actually a, a copy of the scripture, but it's a commentary, which has the shorter ending. So why do some scholars lean towards the shorter ending? Well, there's some other data that turns out to be important too. The Syriac editions don't have the longer ending, nor the Coptic, nor the Armenian. In fact, one scholar did the math and said that of the Armenian versions, 99 out of 220 manuscripts lack it. The Georgian language of the fifth century does not have the longer ending. Jerome does not have the longer ending. Um, and there are additionally, this is kind of curious here, 23 Greek manuscripts which contain notes, asterisks, or marks about the text. In other words, maybe some kind of scribal annotation indicating some doubt as to whether or not the longer ending is legitimate. They contain it, but they have some kind of a, a warrant, almost like the ESV does right here. So when the ESV puts in this line about some of the earliest manuscripts do not contain 16, 9 to 20, that's actually in practice with... Um, scribal habit if there was any sort of doubt or uncertainty. Now, one interesting fact is that Eusebius, who's an ancient church historian, he said in his day that he thought the most accurate copies of Mark did not contain the longer ending. So that would be all the things that are in favor of the shorter ending of the Gospel of Mark. Um, but in favor of the longer ending of the Gospel of Mark, we have Codex Alexandrinus, 5th century, Codex Ephraimi, 5th century, Codex Beza, that was that cool diglot that we looked at. We have Washingtonianus, 4th century, Family 13, which is an important family of manuscripts. We have essentially all of the Byzantine manuscripts. So this would be uh, Maurice Robinson in his Byzantine text form, majority text position. But not only that, but we have references to Mark's longer ending in Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, Ambrose, Augustine, etc. And that includes over 1600 Greek manuscripts, 99% of which contain it. And it seems to have been a reading that was very well known to the early church because they actually used the longer ending as a reading in the lectionary on Ascension Day as early as the fourth century. Okay. So I said that I was going to make up my mind on some of these texts on a case-by-case -case basis. And for me, it certainly seems most probable that the longer ending is legitimate, should be canonical, and therefore I should go ahead and preach this ending on Wednesday, which is exactly what I'm going to do. Now, let's just be fair here and look at a couple of possible solutions to this dilemma. One, so, one uh, solution, I'm gonna minimize my face here, is that the shorter ending is original. This is a logical possibility. If so, this would indicate that Mark's intent was that his gospel ends suddenly at verse eight to have that real gotcha moment as they leave the tomb with fear and trembling. Um, and if so, then how did the longer ending come about? Well, if that's the case, then maybe some later scribe or early church believer came along and added it as an appendix. And if that's true, then we should think of the longer ending of Mark as like a commentary on the text, but not part of the text. So some critical text people would hold that the shoulder, shorter ending is legitimate and therefore the inspired ending. Here's another possibility that Mark ended it in 168, but his colleagues finished the book. Okay. Now that wouldn't be entirely without precedent in canonical inspired material. Okay, that one person wrote the majority, but somebody else polishes up the end. So a parallel to that would be the book of Deuteronomy, which, as we know, if you're a conservative like me with a high view of scripture, you know that Moses is the author of the first five books of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. But chapter 34 of Deuteronomy tells of the death and the burial of Moses. And so apparently somebody else finished that up, unless you believe that Moses reached out of the grave and wrote, wrote about his own death and burial from the dead, uh, or that he saw it prophetically, perhaps. But I think, I think a lot of scholars would just hold that another early believer came along and added that ending, and yet it is canonical and with authority. Plus, we have other books in the Bible that have multiple authors. For instance, the book of Psalms has multiple authors, and there's probably one or two others as well. Um, so that's a possibility that a colleague finished the book. Maybe 
Uh, Mark had to stop because of persecution, illness, travel, or even because of Peter's martyrdom. Remember, Peter, who's Mark's source, was martyred. And so if that happened and Mark just kind of had to stop, then maybe one of his own colleagues, perhaps another inspired writer, came and added the longer ending. And thus, if that's true, then the longer ending should be regarded as canonical as inspired. Another possibility here that I think is kind of interesting is that Mark wrote two editions of his own book. Now, before you dismiss this, just think with me for just a moment how likely it is that Mark would have written multiple copies of his gospel. I don't think it's likely that Mark would write one copy and ship that one out and send it off without ever making another copy himself, because these things are precious, and Mark worked very hard on the gospel of Mark. In fact, I think it's likely that many of the New Testament authors wrote multiple copies of their own book, okay? Um, and sometimes when an author rewrites their own book, they add material to it the second time through. Think of how many editions Calvin has of his institutes, and each one is longer than the others. Uh, Jonathan Edwards, when he wrote letters to people, he wrote his own copy of his own letter so he could keep one and send one. Now, I know that those are way later examples than the New Testament, but it seems likely to me that in the days before copy machines or printers that an inspired author like Mark or Luke or Peter or Paul may have written multiple copies of their own documents, sent off one and kept one, possibly even writing several of them. If that's true, perhaps in one of Mark's editions, let's say the earlier one, he ends at verse eight, but then the same inspired writer writes his subsequent edition and adds a longer ending. Uh, maybe by then he's seen what Matthew did or what Luke did and, and wanted to add similarly. That's entirely possible. And we might even say that it's possible that the shorter ending went south towards Alexandria where the shorter ending seems to be at least present, if not prominent. And perhaps it's possible that the longer ending went north towards Byzantium or towards all of the churches in Asia Minor. If that's true, then both the shorter and the longer endings could be equally inspired. I've not heard many people make this theory, but I'm going to call it, for lack of a better term, the theory of multiple autographa. That is, that the same inspired writer wrote multiple editions or multiple autographs. That there isn't just one autograph, but perhaps multiple. So if you hear that term, I coined it, multiple autographa. And then finally, of course, um, it's possible that the longer ending is the original ending. If this is true, then we have to account for how some copies have the shorter ending. And I think that's pretty easily explained because if you ever have a book um, very often the last page gets torn off through wear or through heavy use. And so it's very possible that as Mark was passed around and copied, eventually the original autograph had the last page worn off. And so some subsequent copies had the shorter ending and the others had the longer ending. That would speak to the longer ending's authenticity while explaining the possibility of the origination of the shorter ending, okay? Well, listen, that's all I've got for you today. I hope you enjoyed uh, the journey through some of these beautiful manuscripts. My goodness, look at these things. And don't forget, you can do that yourself just by going to csntm.org. Uh, that's all I've got for you today. Thank you so much for checking in. I do love you lots. And hey, we'll talk to you later.